How do we go beyond the campus and have a larger effect? This year, in partnership with the Harvard 375th Committee, it is our honor to present a very special Harvard alumnus with our first ever Distinguished Service Award. This award was created in response to requests from students to connect our efforts beyond Harvard's campus and hear directly from an alumnus who has made a significant difference in the sustainability field. This year's winner is a proud alumnus of the Kennedy School and a prominent voice for interdisciplinary approaches to global scale natural resource issues. His principal research areas include food, population, water, climate change, and renewable energy. What do you mean, Heather, this isn't like the Oscars? This is definitely like the Oscars. <clears throat> so this person founded the World Watch Institute in 1974, the first independent research institute devoted to the analysis of global environmental concerns, and the Earth Policy Institute in 2001, which is working toward an environmentally sustainable economy. Our winner is a recipient of many prizes and awards, including two dozen honorary degrees, a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, and recently he was selected as one of foreign policy's top global thinkers in 2010. Described by the Washington Post as one of the world's most influential thinkers, he addresses political and natural tipping points in his most recent book, World on the Edge. <clears throat> he is always looking over the horizon at the big picture, helping us to see where dangers lie ahead. He has been called an environmental Paul Revere. With enormous admiration and respect for his work, I'm very excited to be presenting our first ever Distinguished Service Award to Lester Brown. Lester is a metaphor for sustainability. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you, Jim and Angela. Thank you, Harvard. As I was watching this last event here on stage, it reminded me how much Harvard has changed in the 50 years since I was on campus. <laughs> As the person who traveled furthest to get here today, I get to speak for a few minutes. Um, I was in Aspen last summer and Governor Bill Ritter, now former governor of Colorado, was there. And he was talking about going to a, he'd been invited to, a, to address a group. And he'd driven some distance to get there, and he parked his car and went inside. There was one person sitting on the front row. And he said, I'm going back home. But then he thought, he's already there, and there's one guy who was there. So he decided to go ahead with his talk, so he got up and he basically talked to the guy, and he finished, and he was folding up his things and starting to leave and heading for the exit, and the guy said, wait a minute, where are you going? He said, well, I finished my talk, I'm going home. The guy said, but I'm the next speaker. <laughs> well, <laughs> thankfully, we're not in that situation today. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs> I wanted to talk a bit about some good news in the in the environmental area, which is that carbon emissions in the United States are dropping. They have peaked. They peaked in 2007 and started to decline because of the economic downturn, but they have now continued for other reasons. And this, I think, is one of the most exciting uh, developments anywhere. Um, between 2007 and 2011, coal use dropped 10 percent. Oil use dropped 11%. Natural gas went up, went up 
7%. The net effect was a 7% drop in carbon emissions in four years, and this is in the world's largest economy. But this is only the beginning because there are a number of new trends in motion now. One is the closing of coal-fired power plants. The Sierra Club three years ago launched a Beyond Coal campaign, and their goal is to close every coal-fired power plant in the United States. So far, 106 of our 492 coal plants are scheduled to close in the next year or two. Major progress. One of the most exciting developments in this campaign was the decision by Mayor Bloomberg of New York City last July to contribute $50 million to the Sierra Club specifically for closing coal-fired power plants, specifically for this campaign. He said coal has to go. Now, it's one thing when the president of the Sierra Club, Michael Brun, says coal has to go, or if I say coal has to go, but when, when Michael Bloomberg, one of the most successful businessmen of his generation, says coal has to go, it begins, the idea begins to get more traction. We're also seeing a decline in gasoline use. The U.S. fleet, the U.S. automobile fleet, has not increased for the last two or three years. In fact, it's gone down slightly from 250 million to maybe 248 million. Not very much, but that's a new trend. It was growing, has been growing for decades, increasing. Now suddenly it's no longer growing. And one of the reasons for that is that young people are not addicted to cars in the same way that, that my generation was. We also have the increases in fuel efficiency, and we owe, owe this to the Obama administration. But the goal is by 2025 to have cars using only half as much gasoline as the new cars sold in 2010. So in a 15-year span, the gasoline use consumed per car, new cars sold, will be cut in half. So that's setting the stage for some very substantial reductions in gasoline use in the United States. So we have coal plants closing, we have gasoline use, so coal is dropping. DOE, Department of Energy estimates that this year coal use will drop by about 5% in the US. Um, with gasoline use, there's an interesting sort of what I call the demographics of gasoline consumption. At the lower end of the age scale, Younger people are simply not buying cars the way earlier generations did. Um, they don't socialize in cars the way my generation was. For, for, for us, particularly growing up in a rural community, getting a driver's license is something to drive was sort of a rite of passage. Everyone did it. But that's changing now. And young people socialize on the internet. I was making this conference at a point at a, at a conference in New York yesterday, and Dan, Dan Jurgen, sitting on the other end of the stage, said, when I, I talked about socializing over the internet versus socializing with cars, he said, they're not the same. <laughs> <laughs> so young people are not buying cars, which is one reason why the U.S. car fleet is no longer increasing in size and is beginning to decline slightly. On the other end of the age spectrum, we have the baby boomers just now moving into retirement age. The significance of this is that when, when people retire in this country, their gasoline use drops by from 30 to 50 percent because they've eliminated the, the daily commute. So with record, with the largest age cohorts in our population starting to retire, that also is going to contribute to a decline in gasoline use. We're also seeing what I think of as a basic cultural shift. Um, the idea of a house in the suburbs a half century ago was almost everyone's dream. And, and so we built suburbs and people lived in suburbs, having a home in the suburbs, and obviously a car was something everyone aspired to, but that's changing now. Young people today don't think about the suburbs as part of their future. They think more of, of, of living within the city. So we're, we're seeing a fundamental cultural shift that I think augurs well for energy consumption and carbon emissions. 
We're also seeing bike sharing beginning to, to catch on in a major way. Uh, we saw it in Paris beginning several years ago, in Washington over the last year, been an extraordinary success. And now we're beginning to see it in larger cities. Chicago, 5,000 bikes in the bike share program. Mayor Bloomberg has launched one in New York with 10,000 bikes. So suddenly we have a, a shift in thinking about how we, how we get around, uh, around cities without necessarily depending on cars. Another interesting thing that's reducing energy use in our society, and again, the, I don't think too many have yet connected the dots, but in this country, meat consumption peaked about five years ago, meat consumption per person, and is, has now dropped by something like 7% during this five-year period. And it looks as though this is a continuing trend. And again, it's, it's partly a cultural shift. Um, and and a, a younger people do not consume meat at the same rate as, as earlier generations did. And, and there's much more thought about uh, diet diversity. The less meat we eat, the less energy we consume, so that's good too. Another interesting one, kind of a positive feedback loop for those who think in terms of models, 42% um, of the diesel used in the freight rail sector in this country is used to move coal from coal mines to power plants. So as our use of coal shrinks, as it is doing, the use of diesel fuel to move coal also shrinks. So we get, we get a double uh, uh, effect there in terms of reducing carbon emissions. How much can we cut by 2020? Well, we've seen a 7% cut in carbon emissions in, in the last four years. I think we can, we can really get a lot. I don't mean 10 or 15%. I, I think more like, we can, we can think now, I think about 30 or 40%, particularly if, if the effort to close coal-fired power plants maintains the momentum it now has. I think we can, we can think about cutting carbon emissions from 2000, the 2007 level by up to maybe 40%. Um, from 2007 to 2020. And we haven't really been thinking on this scale before, but I think it's definitely within range now. Um, I look at the things happening here on campus, and I've been exposed to, to quite a few. It's really an extraordinary uh, uh, range of efforts. I'm not sure anyone on campus even knows what all the initiatives are. There are so many now in so many different departments and groups and, and so forth, but it's extraordinarily uh, exciting. Um, and one of the things someone was saying, how do we go beyond the campus and have a larger effect? Well, I think Harvard ought to pick up on some of the, the bigger issues, like bottled water. I mean, it's, it, it's, 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 a, it's such a con job. I mean, we've been convinced that the water in these bottles is better than the water in the tap. But the regulations in most states in this country for tap water are much more stringent than for bottled water. I mean, it's, it's kind of a joke in Giant Foods in Washington and Baltimore, the area where I live. They take tap water in Baltimore, put it in bottles, ship it to Washington and call it, you know, spring water, natural spring water or something, and sell it. And people buy it. I mean, they admit it. It's not a, it's not a corporate secret. Uh, they're just doing it because it works. But I think we have to rethink the bottled water thing. It's the amount of energy that's used, the difference between price of bottled water and tap water, which is about 1,000 to one, is mostly energy. So if we, can, if we can put the squeeze on the bottled water industry and begin to, to actually el eliminate it in some places, that would be great. Some campuses have tried to ban bottled water, and I think they've gotten into legal problems. But maybe if you had a campus vote, and students voted not to have bottled water on campus, that would be a democratic way of doing it that would be difficult to challenge in court. Just an idea. <laughs> I'm staying in, the, uh, staying in the Charles Hotel, which is one of my favorite hotels in so many ways. Just a delightful place, a good kitchen. Um, but in my room, I have bottled water from Fiji. <laughs> Do you know what the water is like in Fiji? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing. And 
I mean, I, I don't know the manager of the Charles Hotel. I think he's probably a reasonably intelligent guy. But here we are, bottled water from Fiji. Um, the other thing I noticed in the Charles Hotel, I mean, they do well with linens and towels and that sort of thing, but the light bulbs in my room are incandescent. So I brought it up at the desk when I was checking out, and uh, since a lot of the clients at the Charles Hotel have business with Harvard, you might want someone have a discussion with them about this. What can I do? This is the question I hear more frequently than any other. And I think people expect me to say, well, recycle your newspapers and change your light bulbs and so forth. Those things are important. But we've got to change the system now. Fundamentally restructure the economy in so many ways. I mean, energy is the obvious one, going from fossil fuels to renewables. But there are a lot of pieces of this that can be undertaken separately like closing coal-fired power plants. I think there are three, still three coal plants in Massachusetts. I think one of them is scheduled to phase out over the next couple of years. But there's still two left, and so that's something to work on, on locally. I mean, you can't just close the plant. You have to also have to work on the alternatives, whether it's efficiency or wind or whatever. I think Harvard, as an institution, can play a leadership role in some of these issues. Pick one of the big ones, like bottled water or closing coal plants or whatever, and, and, and weigh on it, weigh in on it uh, institutionally. If not as, a, as a, in administrative terms, as a, as a student body. I'm pleased and flattered to have been invited back for this occasion. I want to compliment you for everything you're doing. It's exciting. And I want to particularly recognize the awardees today. But we still have a long way to go. We've got to keep pushing. We're winning a battle here and there, but we're still losing the war. And that's the challenge for us. We don't have a lot of time to do it. Time is our scarcest resource. Thank you for everything you're doing. <laughs>